that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy that Eden is on Puget Sound. Hello and welcome to the Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen. I'm your host. Uh, every episode I get to together with a different local comedian and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser known aspects of our local history. Joining me today is Molly Arkin. How's it going, Molly? Good, Chris. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank good. you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, Molly is an ensemble member in Jet City Improv. She is a member of the horror comedy group Blood Squad. She performs in many shows. She performs in Uncle Mike Ruins Christmas around the holiday time. She'll be performing in Fun Bucket this, I believe, March and April at Jet City Improv at 1030s on Saturday night and in a variety of other shows around town. Anything I'm leaving out? That's everything. Everything. That's it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Molly, how long have you lived in the Seattle area? I moved to the Seattle area when I was nine-ish. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I've lived here off and on since then. Okay. So like... 20 years. Cool. Uh, where did you come from when you were nine? Uh, we lived in Manhattan, oh. New York. New York. Wow, that New that Manhattan. <laughs> that Manhattan, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Not the nuclear project. So you've lived out here pretty much your entire life? Yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. Very cool. How much do you know about local history? I know enough to know the streets that I'm on are named after people. Okay. So that's about it. Yeah, like first... Second, first, yeah. third. After Jerry first. Yeah, Jerry first. No, I, Brave pioneer. I would say I don't know a lot, but I pretend to know things when people seem like, like when they're like, oh, you should know this. I'm like, oh, I definitely know that. Yeah, smart tactic. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. And you have no idea what we're going to be talking about today, correct? I have no idea. Excellent. So let's get started. Okay. Maxwell Levy was born in San Francisco sometime in the mid 1800s. Uh, the exact year is not known. Oh. Why? Because we don't know. We don't have his records. Okay. All uh, right. Okay. <laughs> he moved to Port Townsend, Washington in 1889. You know where Port Townsend is? I do. I got engaged near there. Did you? Yeah. And then I went right there after I was engaged. So that's why I know where that is. Awesome. It's the only reason I know. Yeah. It's out on the peninsula. It's on kind of the northeast corner of the Olympic Peninsula. Yes. Mm -hmm. Correct. Port Townsend. You're right, Chris. Yes. <laughs> Verified right here. Uh, Maxwell Levy became a partner in the Chicago Clothing Company and married a woman named Lucy Hogg, who was the daughter of a local sea captain. <laughs> Come on. She... That's like that's the that's like a Decemberist song. It it really is. Lucy yeah. Hogg, who is the daughter of a sea captain. Well, if it, it, the the story is going to turn into much more of a Decemberist song than you can oh possibly gosh, I'm think so of. Happy yeah, about that. yeah. Okay, good. I hope there's like a a rap scallion. Yeah. If you don't know who the Decemberists are, if you like this podcast, you would probably like the Decemberists. The, okay. A lot yeah, of old timey true. sea shanty kind of stuff. Oh my gosh, this is the best. Okay, mm -hmm. so Lucy Hogg, father was a sea captain. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Maxwell Levy went north for a time to prospect during the Klondike gold rush in the late 1890s, but for the most part, Port Townsend was his home. Uh, it wasn't long after he arrived in Port Townsend in 1889 when he learned what his true talent, where his true talents lay, and he began a career in shanghaiing sailors. <gasps> okay. Hmm. Now it's really, now it's really a December. Song. Yes, it is. Oh, okay. So... Shanghai. Are Shanghai. we going to talk about what that means? Yeah, Shanghai. Great, was... I don't know. Okay, awesome. Uh, Shanghai was the practice of coercing sailors to take work upon a ship by unscrupulous means. Um, you could get a sailor into debt and force them to work on the ship instead of going to debtor's prison. You could get them drunk and drag them onto a ship while they were incapacitated, or you could just beat them unconscious and take them aboard, then forge their signature on the ship's manifest. That seems like <laughs> that. Those seem like three very intense leaps in judgment like the first one is like kind of punishment okay i guess i gotta go be on the ship the second one is just like a fun funny trick yeah and the third one is close to murder yeah yeah okay very close to murder all right uh the practice was known as crimping and those who kidnapped <laughs> sailors were known as crimps or crimpers crumping like the dancing uh crimping 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 like the hair like uh yes that's a 
Yes. Come that's... on my podcast where I talk okay, about awesome. hairstyles of the 90s. That's the like, okay, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. It's like curling, but not it's quite. It's like terrible curling. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah. I know a lot more about late 1800s maritime law than I do about 1990s haircuts. That's why we're friends. Yeah, that is. <laughs> Uh, once a sailor was on board and out to sea, they had little choice but to work on the boat until it returned to harbor. According to a 1790 law, if a sailor was on the ship's manifest, it was illegal for them to abandon the ship until the ship reached its final harbor. Meaning that if you reached a port and tried to abandon the ship you were forced onto, you would be in violation of the law and could face imprisonment. So this wasn't like... These weren't short trips i'm assuming no no these are you get onto a ship you're going to china you're going to australia you're going to south america these were or or california up and down the west coast you could be going around you could i mean really this these are worldwide voyages that people would get shanghai to put onto you would be on these for a very long period of time yes the term shanghai originated in san francisco uh if you were forced on a ship you were quote sent to shanghai that's where the term came from Uh, During the California gold rush in the mid-1800s, there was a problem with sailors abandoning ships to seek potentially more profitable career in mining. So ship captains became more open to manning their ships by any means necessary. By clubbing drunk people to convince them to be on a ship. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds terrible. It's the next logical step, right? That sounds like terrible prison. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a prison, (laughs) but you're out at sea. And you have to work on a boat. What if you're not a good boat worker? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Oh, yeah. I, oh no. Uh, yeah, if you, you, you just you would have to be. They would okay. they would prefer sailors, but they would take whoever they could. They All would right. they would Shanghai vagrants. They would Shanghai loggers. Uh, they would Shanghai pretty much anybody. Just just need bodies on the boat. All right. I don't like where this is going. <laughs> Neither did they. I think <laughs> they didn't know. Uh, it wasn't long before Maxwell Levy became king of the port towns and crimps. Was he Jewish? He was not. Come on. I don't believe he was. Was he? I don't know. Might I'm not sure. I, I don't know if he was well, Jewish. Well, we don't or... know his birth certificate. How are we supposed to know if he was Jewish or not? That's true. It's okay for me to talk about this because I'm Jewish. Oh, okay. Just so you know. All in right. case you're worried. Uh, Maxwell Levy became friends with a man named Ed Sims, who was a deputy U.S. shipping commissioner. With a small investment from Sims, Levy became part owner of a boarding house and saloon located right near the harbor called New Sailor's Home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, then they should have known what was going to happen to them. If they were staying at a place called New Sailor's Home. <laughs> Surprise! It should have been called Shanghai Surprise, <laughs> which I think is something else. That sounds like a drink. <laughs> I think it is. Uh, with a prime location on Water Street, within plain view of the wharf, the impressive-looking brick building was an easy choice for sailors disembarking from a long and tiring voyage. If a sailor could not pay for a room and board, Levy would extend them a line of credit. Then, when a new ship came into port, the captain or boarding master would call upon Levy to find sailors for the voyage. Levy would put the indebted sailor in touch with the captain, receive a finder's fee, as well as a portion of the sailor's pay up front to pay back the debt. So he is a a seaman's pimp. Yeah. Yes, he is. I was very careful about how I worded that. And you did well. Thank yes. you. Uh, yeah, so he was, he's basically an intermediary. Between the captains and the sailors. Okay. But he would also, he would kind of inflate his prices and he would say, you have to pay me back this exorbitant amount. Sure. So you have to work on this ship. And it was a very lucrative enterprise. I bet it was. It sounds very illegal and terrible. Uh, that part wasn't illegal. It wasn't illegal just to act as an intermediary and hire sailors. The next part... Is very illegal, okay. though, yeah. So often there were not enough men ready and willing to jump at the chance to work on the ship in question. They either were waiting for a better ship with better pay to come along, they were through sailing, or they were not actually sailors, but travelers or of some other variety who found themselves in Levy's establishment. For these men, Levy would send his runners. They had more unsavory methods of getting men on ships. His top two runners were Charles Gunderson and Chilean Pete. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What was Chilean Pete's real name? Uh, I don't know. He's, oh. he's only ever referred to as Chilean Pete and everything. Maybe I've that read. was his real name. Chilean Pete? Yeah. I'm guessing it was a guy named Pete from Chile. Yeah. But he might have been, yeah. I hope his method of getting um, people on ships was like there's some kind of like chili pepper involved. <laughs> <laughs> chili Pete? Yeah, like um, like Breaking Bad. Like that was his like special oh. <laughs> thing. 
You know? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, just try this tortilla. Oh, I'll eat this tortilla. And, oh, oh, no, no, I'm, oh, I'm no. Conscious. How did I get on this ship? I don't know why everybody has this accent, yeah. but everybody does. Because it's Especially, the 1890s. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, so Chilean Pete, and what was the other? And Gunderson? Charles Charles Gunderson. All right, Gunderson. Uh, the runners would get men drunk, and when they passed out, they would drag them onto sh- onto ships, forge their signatures on the ship manifests, and collect their finder's fee. And then, if their signature is on the manifest, yes. it's illegal for them. But what do they care if they're on there? And would, they're like, oh, I, my name wasn't supposed to be on here. Some Chilean guy wrote it down. Mm-hmm. Can't I leave? People would say, no, that's Well, you're, you're already out to sea oh, by the time you wake it. up, typically. And you would also, in the eyes of a lot of law, if you, you, you did try to contest it, odds are good they would just say, that's your signature. Come on. You're just trying to abandon the ship right now. That's true. Yeah. Ugh. I don't know if they had handwriting experts. Old-timey judges. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> With their mustache wax, so and their... much mustache, and their, and I bet they had some hats. Mm-hmm. Crazy hats. Crazy hats. Ugh. All right. Yeah. If they didn't want to wait for the man to get drunk, they would simply drug his drink and do the same thing when he passed out. Uh, oftentimes, they would just beat the victim to the point of unconsciousness, <laughs> drag them into a rowboat, and row them to the ship, force their signature, and collect their fee. How much of a fee are we talking here for the runners? Fifty dollars at this point, typically. Fifty dollars oh. per man. That's okay. In the 1890s, when you would do that, yeah. I mean, number one, you get a good night on the town. <laughs> you get to get a guy drunk, or you get the added benefit of getting drugs into somebody's drink, which is always like a fun game of you know whack a mole. And then <laughs> you get to take a rowboat out to another ship, and it's just a quick $50. And I'm sure they're not paying taxes, so you got to assume Probably that they're not. bringing in some good money. Yeah. I think uh, the idea of a rowboat ride is less of a novelty and luxury for them <laughs> as it would be like a romantic rowboat ride, as You're opposed right. to this is just a day at work. Because in my mind, it's all, whenever I'm in a rowboat, it's always small world. Like, there's always children singing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's been my experience in rowboat. I hear uh, Kiss the Girl oh, from yeah, Little Mermaid good. in my head when I'm yeah. in a rowboat. Mm-hmm. I don't know if we can talk about those. It, you mean the mermaid film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the mermaid film from... And put your mouth on that girl. Yeah. We, we don't have the rights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pat, copyrights are, all, are, are, are a tricky issue. Okay, so they're kissing girls on these boats. Uh, well, they're, they're kissing girls, dragging unconscious sailors yeah, to know. ship. Same, same, same Basically difference. Basically the job I would want. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so what happened to a Shanghai sailor? Well, John Sutton was a 23-year-old logger. And his logging camp shut down over the summer due to forest fires after he went... So he went to uh, Port Townsend for a little Uh, Mm, R&R. Uh-oh. (laughs) Did he stay at the I Don't Want to Be a Sailor Hotel? Well, he was uh, was at a bar, and a bartender was kind enough to offer him a drink on the house. Mm -mm. Yeah, never a good idea. Uh, And the drink, of course, was drugged. When he woke up, he had been stripped of everything of value and was on the deck of the ship, the Reaper. Which was a three-masted sailing ship, and they were well out to sea. Okay. So he wakes up, he's on this ship, the Reaper, and they're saying, you work on this ship now. Okay. So not a good way to wake up. No. Uh, the first mate of the Reaper was named Bully Hansen. Look at these names. They're so good. We gotta go back. We gotta go back to these names. Uh, Bully Hansen was tasked with breaking the will of the Shanghai sailors, but John Sutton was tough and strong-willed. So Bully... Hit him over the head with an iron belaying pin, fracturing his skull and killing him, then tossed the body overboard. Oh, my... I got so attached. <laughs> to John <Chris>. Sutton. <laughs> Sorry. Man. Okay. So, he's... So, basically, they don't care if you're conscious, awake, whatever. They just want people on these ships. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was not uncommon... Dead. Yeah. It was not uncommon for the ship's captain or first mate to kill one of the Shanghai men to make the others fall in line. Okay. So, make a scared straight example. <laughs> yeah. Scared right. straight. <laughs> I get it. Another strategy was simply denying the man food until he complied and did the work he was assigned on the ship. That would have motivated me. Yeah, me too. I often think, you know, about myself in these situations. Because that's what's going to happen to me if I go to a bar. Yeah. Nowadays. You'll wake up Shanghai. I'll wake up Shanghai. Yeah. And, I, you know, if somebody was like, oh, you can't eat unless you do this ship's work. I'd be like, fine. <laughs> it would not take killing me. Like, within a couple of hours. Like, like not, minutes. Minutes, <laughs> yeah. The, the threat of not Would getting you a like Triscuit. a Snickers bar? Yes, of mm. course. The mm-hmm. answer is yes. Uh, Levy and his runners did not discriminate over, uh, over who they shanghaied, with one exception. No Native Americans. 
Uh, Native oh, ca- oh, broy. Oh, broy. <laughs> oh, broy. Uh, Native Americans were still under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. If any Indians went missing, the federal government would come investigate. But not loggers. Not loggers. Not sailors. Because a lot of these people are just they're 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 just moving through. Yeah, you know and, what? Good for good for you. And the federal people of Bureau. Port Townsend just didn't really seem to care. It, I think it was viewed as like a we're we're cleaning up the streets here because they would Shanghai vagrants, they would Shanghai all these people coming through. So it didn't as long as they didn't Shanghai locals. Are you equating Port Townsend during this time to the Giuliani era of New York City, where he was just like, just get those homeless people off the street? Uh, Is that what I, you're doing? I, I wasn't. I never said anything about New York or Giuliani, but Seems like, you know what? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> Seems like I that's am where indeed. we're going with this whole thing. I don't know a lot about that, Miss Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from New York. All right. And in Manhattan, I don't mean the drink or the clam chowder. No, the New York one. The actual island of Manhattan. Okay, so they're like, just clean up the streets by by any means necessary, except don't touch the Native Americans. People are just kind of looking the other way when right. a lot of this is going but on. But not when Native Americans are protected. Yeah, under, for the, under, under the feds. God. <laughs> Uh, one method Levy would use didn't involve force, but was just good old-fashioned lying. He would convince a group of sailors on one ship that he had an opportunity for them on another ship that had better pay and better conditions. The pay was usually the same, and the conditions were often worse, but by the time the men realized they had already signed uh, contracts and were out to sea, and Levy had collected his finder's fees, usually around $50 per man at this point. That's not even a good lie. Well, it's like it's, a very mundane line. It's effective. Wouldn't you be like, oh, and there's there's pretty ladies but and a magic that. carpet. If, or a, an unenchanted rug? Because <laughs> <laughs> we can't for You're copyright You're right, an purposes. enchanted rug. <laughs> mm-hmm. So he just said, okay, I, I, yeah. I, you know what? It's practical, though. I, yeah. I'll, let, I'll let it slide. You'll let it slide? Yeah. Okay, I'll let Levy know. <laughs> okay. Uh, he was able to convince three crews in a row to abandon the ship America under the promise of better pay elsewhere before the ship's captains was able to secure a crew and leave port. So, and th- then they ended up on the ship named, like, Doom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Levy's top runners, Charles Gunderson and Chilean Pete, were <laughs> attempting to lure some sailors off a British ship one night. Uh, they rowed out to the ship and boarded in an attempt to get the sailors to abandon the ship. They would pay the sailors to desert, then get more and double their investment back in a finder's fee from the other ship's captain once they had essentially transferred the crew over. So they would they would get their finder's fee from Levy and then another finder's fee from the captain. Well, they would go they would go to the captain of, they would go to ship A. Talk yeah. to all the sailors and say you should leave and go to ship B. Okay. Then they go to sh- they'd pay the people to leave ship A and sign up on ship B, and then they would collect finder's fee from the captain of ship B. Oh, tricky, yeah. Chile and Pete. Smart. Mm-hmm. Uh, on this dangerous venture, they were discovered by the captain and first mate. Gunderson and Chile and Pete left. <clears throat> excuse me. Left leapt overboard into the rowboat and frantically rowed to shore. Oh. They were pursued by the first mate and boatswain, who caught up with them. Gunderson attempted to beat them off with an oar. The first mate produced a gun, shot Chilean Pete dead, and wounded Gunderson. No! Yeah. They were so good at their job. They killed Chilean Pete. (gasps) I feel like we just got to know Chilean Pete. (laughs) You're getting attached to these people, and then they're dying. Of course I am! Yeah. This is is a thrilling sea adventure. Mm -hmm. You can't just... You can't just have, you know... Stock characters. No, yeah. These I'm are fully invested. fleshed out Chilean Pete. <laughs> he had a thing. And John Sutton. And Gunderson. And Gunderson. Chilean Gunderson's still alive. Oh, okay. Gunderson right. was Chilean wounded, but Chilean dead. Pete's shot dead. All right. I uh, mean, he's not still alive. He's not still alive today. Gunder- Damn it, Gunderson Chris. is not still alive. Sorry. Take them away from Sorry, me. but almost everybody, if not everybody in the world who was alive in the 1890s is now dead. Mm. I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's. I don't know. That's what Big Funeral wants you to believe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. The, the funeral lobby is strong <laughs> in this country. Okay. So Chilean yeah. Pete is Chilean dead. Pete's dead. Gunderson's Great. wounded. Uh, the two sailors, the first mate and boatswain of this ship that they were trying to lure men off of, uh, stood trial for the death of one man and the wounding of another. But they were acquitted on the murder charges because it was ruled that Chilean Pete was engaging in piracy at the time he was shot. Okay. So it's legal to shoot a pirate if they're pirating. <laughs> to kill them. It's illegal, yeah. So, so they were essentially 
stopping a pirate from pirating their boat. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Gunderson was able to avoid conviction because he claimed he was on the ship, or not on the ship to try to lure away his sailors, but rather that he was invited there as a guest. (laughs) Okay. So he's claiming the the B&B defense. (laughs) Exactly. All right. And the people, I assume in this trial, the people of Port Townsend are not like... They're not that invested or worried because they're still just like, man, whatever, get these people out of here. Uh, I, I, I don't know. All I don't right. know at this I'm point. I'm thinking but... about the jury. The jury, yeah. Maybe there was no jury. Maybe it was just a pirate's court. A, pi- <laughs> a pirate's court would have probably ruled in favor of the pirate. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, know, I know what you mean. Yeah. I just was picturing a whole courtroom full of pirates. <laughs> now, oh, well. Now we all are. Now I gotta now go write that are. sitcom. Mm. <laughs> On August 11th, 1893, a sailor stumbled into the Latona Saloon, which was owned by Max Levy. The saloon was a frequent watering hole for non-Union sailors. Mm. He was being followed by several Union sailors. It is unclear what had happened previously, but the non-Union sailor had been beaten pretty bad. More Union sailors started assembling across the street, and the drunken non-Union sailors, non-union sailors from inside the saloon started exchanging barbs with them. They taunted each other for a time before, the same, uh, before some Union men attempted to enter the saloon. Levy, Gunderson, and the bartender attempted to block them at the door, but to no avail. The Union men swarmed the bar, and a brawl broke out, then shots were fired. No one was killed, but several men were badly injured. Police got the riot under control, and the Latona Saloon was in bad shape. Levy, Gunderson, and the bartender were taken to jail and housed in a separate section from the rest of the detainees, largely to protect them from the mob that wanted to lynch them. I am flabbergasted. First of all, now we're dealing with a union when before it was like whoever's most unconscious is now a sailor. Well, there's union sailors and non-union sailors. Okay. And so uh, most of these people are going to be probably non-union. But when the captains want union sail, they just want anybody. Not necessarily. Oh, all right. So now we've got this union faction. This they're union, non-union. Up the where they're scabs. They're, yeah, there's this big brawl breaks up between union and non-union. Terrifying. Mm-hmm. The police are... Not impressed the, well, the with police, their behavior. The police go through, yeah. They're they're not they're not really they're not charmed. So they go and they try to they bust up the thing. They, okay. they bust up the riot. They take haul everyone into jail. Every union, non-union, Every, everybody. They take everybody that's participating in the riot is going to jail. All right. Uh, Levy went on trial for assault and was defended by the Shipowners Association of San Francisco. The lawyer claimed that the proprietors of the club were merely defending themselves and Gunderson was firing warning shots into the ground to try to keep a riot from breaking out. I feel like Gunderson has about two strikes on him right now. You think so? All right. Yeah, I was a guest. I was firing my gun (laughs) into the ground. Yeah, once is a, once is a, maybe an accident, maybe incidental, but. Whatever this third thing is, he's gonna get. It's like that friend that you know that's always getting fired. And then they're like, it wasn't my fault. It yeah. wasn't my fault. And like, okay, maybe the fifth time, I'm yeah. not going to believe it wasn't your fault anymore. The next time he's involved in something, he's going to be like, the knife ran into him. Yeah. Oh, oh no, did mm. I? Ugh, I called it. Uh, the prosecution argued a different story. They claimed that the whole affair had not been a matter of union versus non-union, but the man that went into the saloon in the first place was not beaten up by union sailors, but by Levy himself. Uh Uh-oh. They claimed that he entered the saloon in order to retrieve a ring he lost there a few weeks ago, and Levy and his goons beat him up. Well... The initial beatings were what started the riot in the first place. Well, hold on. I didn't hear anything about a ring earlier. (laughs) That's true. This is new information. This is new information. The prosecution has just introduced new evidence. Mm -hmm. Now we get to find out if there was a ring. Well. Stay tuned. Yeah. You don't, do you have a cliffhanger yet? Dun, 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 dun. And now the conclusion. Oh my God. (laughs) We're back. The trial ended with a hung jury. Oh no. Because there's two completely conflicting stories. Right. Uh, The second trial acquitted Levy on all charges. Oh. So he's he's so free he's to go. Good. He's he's good. Yeah. Ring or he's no ring. Ring or no ring. He's Was a free like man. Was this like the first? I'm gonna bring up another uh, pop culture, just so I can put it in terms I understand. The ring is like the glove in the OJ case. The ring did not fit anybody. Uh, I'm stuck on this ring. <laughs> okay, the ring rings. Is probably what started the whole thing in the first place. Okay, so but there was a ring. There, there probably was a okay. ring, but we, we'll never know. We'll, we'll, never, ne- we'll know. never know. Yeah. 
Uh, after the riot incident, Levy became bolder. A ship's captain in port started hiring sailors without Levy's consent, either unaware or uncaring of Levy's reputation as the go-to guy. So Levy and his runners beat the captain mercilessly. He became bolder than getting men drunk and kidnapping them. <laughs> right, because now he's attacking ship captains that he has nothing to do with. Is he just turning men into scarecrows? <laughs> Putting them on ships and saying, good luck, idiot. Well, now he's kind of like the, the boss of Port Towns. Okay. He's kind of like, so he's like, everybody's got to come through me. Oh, I wanted to do like a mob thing there, mm-hmm. but all I could no, do was is good. That was, that was good, yeah. All right. Uh, one night, Gunderson was trying to get a man drunk, but he came frustrated about the time it was taking and the man's ability to hold his liquor. So instead of waiting for the man to become so intoxicated he could load him onto a ship... He hit him over the head with a bar stool and kicked him in the face until he lost consciousness. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> uh, Gunderson then put him on a ship bound for Australia, collected his finder's fee, and continued about his business. Australia? Australia. The country? And the continent. That's so far... That's a long trip. Oh, and it's a long trip. And there's no, like, stopping they, over. They might have stopped in Hawaii or one of the other islands. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, no, probably not. That's so, that's, that's a long terrifying. Trip. Yeah. That's like three years. Well, the man returned to Port Townsend as soon as he was able to and went looking for Gunderson. Yeah. And he stabbed Gunderson seven times. <gasps> Uh-oh, Gunderson? <laughs> I knew it! He, the man uh, ran into him. Gunderson survived. <laughs> oh. Seven stabbings. Uh, but suffered permanent damage of the, in the tendons of his neck and arms. He quit his position as a runner for Levy and lived the rest of his life as a fisherman. Oh, Gunderson. Well, you feel bad for Gunderson? Yeah, he was just a guest on that one ship. Okay. He couldn't get his gun to fire in the right direction that other time. Yeah. And now he's got a he's got a bum arm. He's got bad tendons. But he's still fishing. I guess he just, ugh, out into the sunset, Gunderson. Yeah. And I'm you, Team Gunderson. You're Team Gunderson. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right, so he's he's done with. He's done with. This yeah. guy who came back from Australia hungry for Gunderson blood. Mm-hmm. What's He stabbed him seven times and then took off. And did the court did the pirate no, court It's all good. Co- okay. All right. It's all good. They're like, "Oh, he it was deserved." Yeah. All right. Probably. I don't know what happened to him exactly. All right. I'm An- not going to get attached. <laughs> Another man who swore revenge on Levy after being placed on a ship to Hong Kong returned to Port Townsend, and didn't have the foresight until wait to wait until Levy was alone. So the man who had been shaped, placed on the ship to Hong Kong barged into his office while Levy was talking with two of his runners and attacked him. Severely outnumbered, the man was beaten unconscious. Uh, I mean, what else is new with these guys? Yeah. Everything is like... Beating, he, beatings are kind of old news. Took a bar stool, shoved it in his groin, slapped him in the face, got him on a ship. <laughs> yeah. Next. Yeah. It's business. It's like assembly line. Yeah. Shanghaiing at this point. So I have, I, I just, in my mind, I just picture all of these men, like, uh, like just like carving Levy's name into the side of a ship mm-hmm. for the years that they're on these ships, just like, as soon as I get back. And so, of course, he couldn't wait. He's, like, back in Port Townsend. I, what is he going to do, like, at 3 o'clock? He takes his tea. He'll yeah. be alone. No, you well, get off the ship and you run. Well, he's been he's, he's been planning this since he left for Hong Kong, and yeah. now he's back from Hong Kong. So you'd figure he'd have, maybe have a little bit more patience. But I can't judge in that situation. Yeah. I mean, he probably didn't get his Triscuits. <laughs> he was told, I was so. going to say, he's been told he can't eat for years. Ugh. Uh, in 1895, a law was passed uh, to try to prevent Shanghaiing that said mm. a man had to uh, be in full... Full charge of his faculties, essentially, not be drunk or incapacitated or under duress when he signed onto a ship. That's the tattoo law. Mm. It's the same as when you get a tattoo. Oh, you can't. You can't be. Yeah, you can't. Well, I think there's medical oh, reasons. I think for I've that. heard that. Yeah, you can't have any. You can't have been drinking at all when you yeah. get a tattoo. Yeah, mm-hmm. unless you're 18 in Italy. <laughs> hey, is that your story? No, but somebody. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, fortunately for Levy, he was friends with Ed Sims, the guy who had financed his boarding house, yes. who was a deputy U.S. shipping commissioner and the man who helped him finance the, yeah, the boarding house. Uh, he was willing to look the other way if any problems arose. Ed Sims, at this point, was also Levy's ex-wife's current husband. Uh, uh, so Lucy ex-wife. Hogg. Lucy Hogg. They got divorced. Daughter of a ship's captain. Yeah. They got divorced. I miss that. And married Ed Sims. He, she married Ed Sims. Oh. So they're just one big happy family. Well, we don't know that. Well, they're they're they've they've got common interests. That's true. Shanghai they're protecting people. each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, good for Lucy, you know. Yeah. I feel like that's an upgrade. 
Uh, when he found men for a ship at this point, he would receive $90 per man, an mm. additional $20 to supply them with clothes and other gear they would need at sea. Oh, that's a $60 raise. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, Levy acted as intermediary to supply 20 sailors to a British ship. But before they left Port Townsend, the sailors were threatening to mutiny due to the conditions they had been signed on to work under. The ship's captain called Levy, and Levy called the British Council. Uh, thinking that since it would be illegal for the sailors to abandon the ship or break their contract, the council would sign with the captain. Side with the captain. Okay. And the, cap- the council did not. Oh. The represent- representation from the council showed up and were horrified by what they saw. The $20 that Levy had been given to supply the men with clothing and equipment had clearly gone straight into Levy's pocket. A doy is yeah. what I would say to that <laughs> British commission. Uh, the clothing the men were given looked like, 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 they, like they had been taken out of dumpsters and smelled like they had been taken off corpses. <laughs> oh, my God. And neither scenario is likely far from the truth. And neither uh, scenario is good, right? Yeah. We don't want dead people clothes. Right. And some of the clothes, clothing was women's clothing. Oh, no. Oh, I couldn't possibly be kidnapped on this ship in a lady's shirt. Well, it wasn't the most rugged and, and, and weatherproof clothing back then. All right. So. Tell that to the four skirts women had to wear in a corset. Uh, I don't know. I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> don't listen to me. You know about crimping. I know about crimping. Mm-hmm. In 1990, what? No. You keep going. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The council demanded that Levy supply the men with appropriate clothing, which he reluctantly did, and the ship set off to sea. This argument about clothing seems like the least of Levy's worries at this time. Yeah. Just give them some wool socks or something. Mm -hmm. Then beat them senseless and get them on the ship. Beat them senseless. Uh, 1896, Levy and one of his runners, Thomas Newman, incapacitated two men for a ship rowed them out to a vessel, and left them on the deck. One of the men woke up and jumped overboard to attempt to swim to shore rather than being stuck on the ship for God knows how long. Smart. Thomas Newman saw the barely conscious man struggling in the water and rowed over to him, likely saving his life. Or, more likely... Double Shanghai him. <laughs> Shiving him in the face and putting him back on the ship. Well, he pulled him, pulled him out of the water, saved his life, and Maxwell Levy was not pleased with Newman's kindness. So Levy beat him within an inch of his life. I knew it! <laughs> Shocking at this point, right? Uh, Levy was charged with assault with a deadly weapon for nearly killing his employee while they were committing a crime. But the case was dismissed. Mm. Levy is Teflon. Levy? Nothing, nothing sticks to him. Levy is my current personal hero. Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a man who gets what he wants. He really, he has a plan, he goes for it, he makes it happen? Yeah. Oh, boy. So, even after that incident, Newman continued working for Levy. What? <laughs> oh, my, I would quit, I quit my job if, if, if I'm If somebody like, looks at you funny? <laughs> well, I wish. No, I don't wish. Um, <laughs> no, but, like, that's. That's extreme loyalty, is yeah. what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I think at the turn of the century was uh, bred out of people. You think so? Yes. You think that you, you would rather go back to those times when if your employer beats you to death? No, to I'm death? saying like at the turn of the century, something happened where people were like, I don't have to put up with this shit anymore. It's the 1900s. <laughs> I'm going to get a new job. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Maybe. But also... Probably not. Yeah. Oh, man. It's hard not to talk about minimum wage. <laughs> <laughs> that is the next logical step, <laughs> right? Oh, brother. Okay, so mm-hmm. he's like, this is, I mean, this is a classic, classic, oh, gosh, classic case of abuse, right? Mm. Your employer makes life miserable for you, but you're like, ah, oh, it's a job, so you go back. Mm-hmm. All right, well, mm, I'm not looking forward to this for Thomas Newman. Uh, in May of 1896, the two were brought to court over allegedly stealing baggage from a sailor named Alex von Hagen. Uh, they were holding the baggage hostage until Hagen paid them $50, which he supposedly owed them for staying at the boarding house. This was an artificially inflated price, and Hagen refused to pay. U.S. Commissioner James G. Swan heard the case and dismissed it on the grounds that they give him the, back the luggage. Okay, so again, fair. Charging, charges filed. Did he stay? Charges dropped. Was he staying? He stayed at the there, ho- but fifty dollars for staying at the boarding house would have been exorbitant. He, that that certainly wasn't the price he agreed to That's pay. That's the price for a man to go on a ship. That is, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Shortly after the luggage incident, Levy was walking down the street where he saw a man named Charles M. Carlson leaning on a railing. <laughs> Kill him! <laughs> Completely unprovoked, Levy picked up a rock and threw it at Carlson's head. What? <laughs> hitting him in the eye. I, I swear <laughs> to God, I'm not trying to do the thing that, that I'm not supposed to do. you're psychic right here, yeah. No, but like, that's... Don't kill him, is what I should have said. Okay, alright, so now it doesn't matter if you're near a ship, if you've ever heard of a ship, if you yeah. know what if a you ship are is. In, if you are in a stone's throw distance of Maxwell Levy, he will throw a stone at you. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> it's a it's a stone-throwing kind of guy. Yeah. Okay? Uh, once again, he was charged, this time with assault and battery. Levy, at this point, was not much of a popular figure in Port Townsend. And Why? It, <laughs> I don't know. Seems like an agreeable gentleman. Mm -hmm. A huge gathering of people showed up at the courthouse to see him convicted. Yeah. There were multiple witnesses who saw him approach Carlson and attack him completely unprovoked. Levy told a different version of the night's events. He took the stand and said Carlson was interfering with boarding house business and was trying to entice men away. He claimed that he saw him leaning against a rail on the street and decided to have a civil chat with him about the matter when Carlson kicked him in the stomach and that he had no choice but to defend himself. Was And when do we get to the person in the courtroom who was going like this? <laughs> Bullshit! <laughs> Bullshit! Yeah. That would have been me. That would have been you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I would have been too busy with my ladies' <laughs> wear. Uh, from his court testimony, quote, When I saw Carlson standing by the red front store, I just wanted to talk to him about what he was doing. Oh. In the middle of the conversation, he kicked me in the stomach. I was just defending myself when I hit him back. So he's basically describing himself as if it were Carlson. Yeah. As like a just crazy man who unprovoked <laughs> murders people. Yes. Uh, two other witnesses said they saw Carlson strike first. Oh, shit. So a whole bunch of people said Levy struck first completely unprovoked, and then two witnesses said that Carlson attacked first. Were they yes. Gunderson I'm, and I, Chilean <laughs> Pete? I'm, 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 you know, I, I, I wasn't there, but I'm fairly certain they were on his payroll. Uh, it, yeah. I would be shocked if they were not. Yeah. Uh, because there were multiple stories being told, the jury was unable to reach a verdict, and Levy once again walked away a free man. God damn it. Yeah. Of course he did. Of course. I'm going to go back in time, and I'm going <laughs> to do nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to go back in time. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in 1906, new laws were signed into effect, which added more restrictions under the circumstances when a man can sign onto a ship, as well as, as making it legal for a sailor to leave a ship if they had just cause, as determined by a board of commissioners. Didn't we already do, we already said they couldn't be brought onto a ship under duress. But now or... they're starting to enforce it. <laughs> it's, it's, it only took I can't, all of these things years. is just, I can't believe that these weren't already laws. Well, I can't, it really is, I think it really is the thing of like, well, we don't know until it happens mm. that it's bad. Yeah. Uh, failure to comply with these laws was punishable by a fine of 200 to $500. That's like four men on a <laughs> ship. <laughs> I'm going to do everything and how many men it would be to get onto a ship. Yeah. Okay. Well, but you know what? What? That's not that much money. Yeah. Well, if you're if you're supplying a crew of 20 people and it's $50 per person, then it might be worth it. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, unions became stronger and did a better job of protecting sailors from men like Levy. Levy continued to Shanghai people for as long as he could, but the new laws made it more difficult. I bet he finds a way. Well, then came the rising prominence of steamships, uh -oh. which needed smaller crews, cutting down on the demand for sailors, and the enterprise became more trouble than it was worth. Why use men when you can use steam? Steam, yeah. Is that a poster? <laughs> Is that a slogan? It should have been. I'm going to go back in time. You have a, a lot to do with your time machine. Uh, Levy retired from Shanghai in 1910. He just gave up. He gave it up, yeah. All oh, because a couple of pesky laws got in his way? And some steam men. He's never been a man to be worried yeah. about steam or laws. <laughs> He's never been really worried about anything. Ah. <sighs> Except for people leaning on railings. He's got <laughs> yeah. to nip he's that shit in the bud right there. You asshole! <laughs> Get off that rail. Uh, he operated for over 20 years and was never convicted of a crime. Ever. Ever. He was not convicted of one crime in his entire operation. What a guy. In 1912, he moved to San Francisco, where he died in 1931. How old was he? We don't know, because we don't know when he was oh, born. Oh, that's right. Exactly. We don't yeah. know. We don't but have any was, records. Let's see. we got to assume that he was at least 20 when he came to Port Townsend, which was in 1899. So that would 
42 years old. So at least at least 62 years old. Oh, okay. That's not that maybe, impressive. May, maybe, maybe older. Wow. But at the very least, he was probably about 62 years old. You know what? I want to take back what I said about him being Jewish. I don't want to put that on the Jewish people. He sounds like a terrible man. Yeah. I don't want to say I'm glad he's dead. Well, ev- like I said, everybody from that time is dead, so... Well, but, yeah, you're right. It's okay that he's dead. What a guy. Yeah. What a terrible, terrible human being. Yeah. Do you think he got any perverse pleasure out of this? Oh, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he... Like, it wasn't... It couldn't have just been about making a buck. No. Right? That was probably, an uh, uh, like, the, the reason he said he did it. But people that do stuff like this horrible, people that are this... This awful and this deplorable. I mean, he had to have had no conscience. But there's other ways to make money if you have no conscience. There's got to be some some kind of satisfaction he got out of out of this operation. But not railings. Not no railings. satisfaction from no, railings. No railings are actually. I take that back. Maybe he maybe he loved railings and didn't want any terrible, dirty potential sailors rubbing their grubby, disgusting backs on them. Yeah, that's that's another possibility. Why didn't he use that defense in his trial? Uh, that's hard to say. Hard to say. I wasn't there. I wasn't his lawyer. I mean, you will be there soon. I'll be there. With your time machine. Oh my gosh. This is... And you know what's so interesting, too? I bet you could do this now. Shanghai people? Yeah. I bet it happens all the time. Oh, wait. It's called human trafficking. It is, yeah. it's oh, Human trafficking God. does exist right now. I was trying to make sure. a joke out of that, and it's... That I'm not gonna do that. Okay. Can we link to some kind of don't listen to Molly website that then leads you to like supporting human trafficking? Not supporting it, supporting stopping it. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> you know what? I'd like to believe that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, Max Levy was that his name? Max Levy, yeah. Max Levy, you horrible human being. He was a horrible man. person, yeah. And he's just one of many people that were that were doing this up and down the West Coast during this time period. I can't imagine. Was Seattle free of Shanghaiers? It happened. Not it as often. Here. This was, I mean, Port Townsend was kind of the, the Shanghai and capital of the West Coast. Uh, but it, it happened here. I did find some newspaper articles about uh, a couple people that were allegedly Shanghai. And they were like, it was it was front page in the newspapers and there were investigations about it. So it wasn't really as as, as prominent here as it was. In, it did happen, but not as much in Port Townsend. Or as, as in Port Townsend. From the way that you were saying that, that you were going to be like, it wasn't that bad. I just, it was like, <laughs> it was a couple months on a ship, but how bad can that be? Well, one thing I say a lot is we can't impose our own morality on the time period. Do you, you can't, say like, that a lot? I do say that a lot. But at this, I, I think we can absolutely impose we our own impose. morality and say it's it's wrong to kidnap people and put them on ships against their will where the ship's captain will kill one of them to put the others in line and force them to go on a multi-year transoceanic voyage for no pay but if i'm max levy i'm just hearing like it's wah, 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 wah. <laughs> I, you just become a charlie brown adult yeah i mean sad boy yellow shirt <laughs> adult we don't have the right. No, no, exactly. Is that it? That's the end of the Shang. That's, the, uh, end that's of the, the end of Max Levy. And after his twenty-year run as a he moved to San crimper, Francisco. Yeah, uh, he moved to San Francisco. We never heard from him again. Yep. He died like he lived, without any kind of certificate. Mm-hmm. Died Man. as he was born. Yeah. Man. Mm-hmm. And we don't have any kind of Max Levy Day. We don't. Well, we don't celebrate. I mean, there's. Why, why would we have a Max Levy Day to celebrate? Why you know? do we have Columbus Day? All right. The, <laughs> the political <laughs> opinions of Molly Arkin, everybody. Ugh, you're welcome, mm. America. Yeah. Wow, I am, I am again, flabbergasted. Yeah, this went on for a long period of time, and it, it's just, it's, uh, there, there's no communications between between different ports, and so yeah. it would have been really hard to, to track if people got Shanghai, and a lot of people would probably, if, if they were able to, claim that they were shanghai if they wanted to abandon the ship and go to port mm. so there's a lot of uh, uh there, there's reasons for the initial law that sailors can't abandon their ship but it was exploited to a horrible degree by a lot of people during this time period american ingenuity mm-hmm. at its finest yeah find the loophole and charge 50 bucks a man for it well, thank you for listening to the seattle files once again my name is chris allen huge thank you to molly arkin for being the guest today 
Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'll be back next week with a new episode with a new topic and a new guest. Um, like us on Facebook. Subscribe and rate in iTunes. Um, if you have a topic suggestion for something that you would like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at the Seattle Files at gmail.com. Be back next Tuesday with a new episode. Thank you for listening. So 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 thank you for listening.